Hello and welcome to Legally Speaking with me, Tarun Nangia. Today is a very, very interesting show on a very, very interesting topic. Today is our part four of our series on Justice Sanjay Kishan Call, an illustrious tenure. Uh, we will look back on his judgments, uh, uh, the initiatives that uh, he's been part of, including establishment of arbitration centers in the country. Uh, also, a lot of other personal anecdotes uh, and also uh, his views on uh, what we would like to call uh, settlement out of court or in common parlance known as arbitration and mediation uh, that have caught on in the country in the past few years. So there is, has been an acceleration, uh, mainly due to encouragement by judges uh, like Justice Paul. Uh, I would like to welcome my panel today. Let me Welcome Senior Advocate uh, NL Raja. He joins us from the city of Chennai. And uh, of course, he will have a lot to share about Justice Call and the initiatives that he has taken and Mr. Raja himself has been part of. I have uh, with me Neha Nagpal. Uh, she is founding partner of NM Law Chambers, one of uh, chambers focusing on financial crime practice, uh, uh, a well-known name in that fraternity. Uh, good to see you, Neha, and looking for some interesting insights on justice call. Uh, I have with me Kunal Bajani. He's joint managing partner of law firm Fox & Mundell. He's also a court member in India of the ICC Court of Arbitration. He will bring his insights on the show. Uh, good to see you, Kunal, once again. Uh, at the outset, uh, let me request senior advocate NL Raja uh, well, uh, if you re reflect upon Justice Call's tenure and give me an introduction of uh, what you would like to share with the viewers today. Good evening, everybody. Actually, uh, Justice Call came to Chennai uh, when the Chennai High Court was itself in a state of turmoil, so to say. Uh, there were a lot of things happening and uh, Justice uh, uh, Call, when he came here, had a very difficult task cut out for him. Um, I don't think anybody would have willingly wanted to be the Chief Justice of Madras at that point of time. But anyway, um, he was sworn in as Chief Justice. And uh, as we know, Justice Call loves challenges. So being a Chief Justice of the Madras High Court was a formidable challenge at that point of time. Um, and we expected very little from a Chief Justice because the situation was so difficult that we could not imagine that any single authority can make a difference at that point of time. But he handled it with phenomenal, uh, I mean, he didn't just come in with hammer and tongs and try to straighten everything out. He did it by a combination of persuasion, gentle persuasion, hard persuasion at times. Uh, winning over the confidence of the lawyers and the judiciary, his brother judges, being tough when it was necessary for him to be tough, being gentle when it was necessary for him to be gentle, and most importantly, being receptive to views from various sections of stakeholders of the justice system. So, as I said, his initial days were stormy days. I still remember that uh, you know during the initial days, there are a set of lawyers who stormed into his court hall and raised slogans inside the court hall, inside the court hall of the Chief Justice of the Madras High Court. I mean, this has never happened in the history of the Madras High Court. And uh, here was uh, Justice Cowell holding court, and uh, this group of lawyers were raising slogans in Tamil. So obviously. Justice Paul did not understand what was going on. And they were raising slogans, asking him to go back to Delhi. So, but uh, Justice Paul didn't understand what was going on. So he leaned across to his brother judge and wanted to find out what they were saying. So the brother judge was a little reluctant uh, to tell him that this was what was happening. But when he pressed on, the brother judge said, told him that they want you to go back to Delhi. Um, and uh, since I was in the first few rows, I could hear what you were saying. He said, oh, these are my friends, because I also want to go back to Delhi. 
So this was his reaction at that point of time. Anybody would have got so flustered and walked out to the court hall. He didn't get, get up and walk out to the court hall. He still continued to hold court and uh, managed to get them out of the court without too much of you know manhandling or anything like that. So then we knew that Justice Cowell was here to stay. And uh, once at a meeting, I think there were just the two of us because uh, he had interested the work of setting up the arbitration center um, at the Madras High Court to Justice Sudhakar, who is now president of the National uh, NCAT. So Justice Sudhakar had started work on it and had requested me to help because we had some experience in establishing the Nani Palkival Arbitration Center in Chennai in 2005. And Justice Sudhakar was again uh, excellent in execution of these projects. And um, we had requested Justice Cowell to come and inspect this building that we were putting up, this facility that we were putting up. And just I think the two of us were in the room at that point of time, possibly a couple of more lawyers. And he was telling me, because I had met him earlier and given him my book on the history of the Madras High Court, which I happened to write on the occasion of the 150 years of the Madras High Court title, uh, A Journey of a Crown Court to a People's Court. Uh, he had read it and uh, he was sharing his thoughts with me and he said that, you know, when I told my friends and relatives that I have been posted as Chief Justice of the Madras High Court, they told me that, uh, you know, you have sufficient seniority in the judiciary and all that you need to do is to stay still and you will ultimately rise up to the top, you will go to the Supreme Court, but knowing the person you are, we request you to not become adventurous and try anything in the Madras High Court, just leave things be. And he said that possibly that was the thought with which I came to Chennai. I don't believe it. I don't think he ever, you know, uh, concedes to any such request. But he said that I, I, I came to Chennai with those thoughts um, being heard loudly in my ears. But uh, when I came to Chennai, I realized what a glorious institution this was. This was one of the chartered high courts. It had uh, a, a, a tremendous history. It has great people who have been part of this institution. And I cannot, as a Chief Justice of the Madras High Court, sit still and allow all this to go to dust. So he set about uh, transforming the Madras High Court or putting it back on its feet uh, with vigor and purpose and uh, succeeded remarkably well during the period of possibly two years and a little more than that when he was here. That thank you, thank you, thank you for that opening comment and sharing uh, these two anecdotes that you did with us. Uh, uh, I'll go to Neha Nakpal, founding partner of uh, NM Law Chambers. Uh, Neha, your uh, you have seen Justice Call since the inception of your career in law, and maybe before that also. Uh, of course, knowing in in that capacity, could you share a few anecdotes and your opening comment? So I have. Um seen Justice Call since I started my career as a judge in the Delhi High Court. Then, of course, we missed him when he was, uh, you know, at other assignments, including Chennai. And then finally, um, through the, his innings in the Supreme Court, I've appeared before him multiple times. Um, the, in the Delhi High Court, I saw him, you know, do a multiple of matters, which was right from, uh, there were issues where, where the writs can be filed before, um, you know, if the cause of action partially arises in Delhi and partially arises somewhere else because the tribunal is here and you're coming against a tribunal order, can it be maintainable here? Very patiently, he did all those hearings. Something even on trademark issues, then one heard it appeared before him. Of course, at that point, I was a relatively young child in the profession still. So I was more assisting senior counsels. By the time he was in the Supreme Court, I um, was appearing before him and, you know, and, and again in the Supreme Court, one heard him um, appear before him on a multiple of issues. I remember in one divorce matter where he was uh, very compassionate towards the father and he said, listen, nothing doing. The, the child can be with the mother because the mother has the right because it's a little child. But I am not denying the father the right. Either both your parents sort it out or I'm jumping in. Um, very compassionately, he then called both the couple, the couple into the, into his chamber, counseled them, which was very. Un I remember my client coming out and saying, "I'm in awe of this man." Then I remember twenty first of April, twenty twenty three, when in the until matter, 
uh, the until matter is on, of course very um, a big case on 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 uh, fundamental rights of right to liberty where he you know took a position where he said listen if the lower courts are not implementing our order where if charge sheet no arrest cases then it's high time judicial officers also have to go for training and because we will not have uh, fundamental rights and right to liberty compromised uh, very beautifully he handled the issue passed directions clarified his previous order slayed the law down again in another matter of where uh, appeals are pending and 50% sentences um, have been 50% um, of sentences have been completed even in that issue very uh, strongly came out supported the um, you know rights of the accused even though they were convicted but if they've spent 50% of their time uh, conviction time and sentences are um, and appeals are pending he was very clear about it so what i really gathered from the man was here is a larger than life compassionate human being sitting on the bench he knows the law at the back of his hand he wants he's here to deliver justice but at the same time he's doing it with compassion in his heart and which made it very interesting appearing before him because he was very kind also encouraging of uh, women uh, lawyers too and younger lawyers too thank you thank you for that opening comment uh, of course as you have said the Satyendra Kumar until judgment is now being cited by lawyers time and again in the court of law. Yes. Uh, and of course, uh, that, is, that, is, also... that is to a great extent his legacy as well. So, and Justice uh, Paul's contribution to pro, pro liberty stance is something that will be remembered always. Uh, Correct. I'll go to Kunal uh, Bajani. Uh, and uh, Kunal Bajani will give us inputs from both ends of the spectrum, from the litigation end. And from the arbitration end also, uh, Kunal Rajani, over to you. Thanks, Arun. I think uh, I would love to start by wishing Justice Call a very, very happy birthday today. Okay. It's his birthday. He formally demits office on this day. And uh, whilst he, you know, goes to his newer innings and creates another era or legacy in its wake, it would be fantastic to wish him luck on behalf of all of us in the legal fraternity and the litigants who have had the hands of justice through him. Uh, knowing Justice Call was a person of a very different personality. I saw him as a judge of the Delhi High Court in the early 2000s, just a few years after he was appointed as a judge. And, uh, you know, in, the, in your previous shows, I have, you know, seen them and, you know, there were lovely adjectives used for him like gregarious, hospitable, and there were wonderful thoughts, his classmates, law your lawyers who appeared before him, his friends in terms of senior advocates, all of them expressing various kinds of adjectives for him. But as a person who has seen him from not that side of life, but on the other side of the bar and the bench, I would call him with a lot more other adjectives, like a bold judge, but still agile, very versatile. You know, if you pick up any topic or any subject which had any touch of law, you will certainly find a delivery from Justice Sanjay Kishak. There is no subject through his 22 years of tenure that he has not dealt with. He has, I think, elucidated and interpreted law to the best possible manner that it could have been he, like Neha said, is a person with a lot of humane touch. I have, you know, appeared before him as a rank junior in the Delhi High Court, a junior lawyer even in the Supreme Court. But there has never been a feeling, and I used to come from Mumbai at that point of time, and there has never been a feeling that a young guy and an outsider is appearing before me. I think I got the same audience that anybody would have got before him. And that humane touch made it welcoming to go to his court. It's, he has been a pace setter for freedom of speech and expression. All of us know his judgments speak on those aspects, right of privacy. And one particular judgment that I particularly remember is the judgment of M.F. Hussain, where he dealt with art. And when he had a very, very touchy subject of art to deal with, and he said, I think he relied on Picasso, who said art is chaste. 
And he then goes on to say that if art is not chased, it is not art. So I think we've seen too many facets of justice call and, and truly a judge demitting office out of court too, but still leaving back a large legacy of everyone remembering him to have been a judge which this country would miss in future times. Thank you for that opening comment, uh, Mr. Kunal Rajani. I'll go to Mr. NL Raja. Uh, Mr. Raja, uh, you were witness and had some sort of a role in an arbitration center which was set up in the city of Chennai, namely uh, 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 the Nani Palka, Palkiwala Arbitration Center. Could you reflect on those times and share a few anecdotes from them? Uh, well, uh, we started the Nani Palkiwala Arbitration Center after Mr. Palkiwala passed away. You see, Mr. Palkiwala had such great regard for the city of Chennai. He felt that Chennai was, Madras as it was called then, was the intellectual capital of the country. And he said this several times, so many times. And a large part of his wealth, he left to an organization here in Chennai, which was the Shankar Netra. And Mr. Kaur also had such great and phenomenal respect for uh, Mr. Parkiwala, obviously, who would not have respect and regard for him. So uh, in his memory, we thought that uh, Chennai must have institutions. So with Mr. Datar, we started the, I mean, even earlier, uh, Datar and a few of Mr. Parkiwala's uh, friends and um, you know, with, uh, fans, I would say, had started the Parkiwala Foundation. And then in 2005, in 2004, I joined the uh, Parkiwala Foundation in 2005. Um, Mr. Datar and I were sitting in a courtroom and we happened to hear the case which was, which arose out of some proceedings between Videocom and Tamil Nadu Electricity Board in Singapore, in the uh, SAS. So we uh, were wondering why this was happening and we felt that uh, India has so much talent that we must start encouraging more and more institutional arbitration centers which were not, uh, at least that's my view, uh, when you call it alternate dispute resolution center, my idea of something that is alternate is, it is alternate to government, it is alternate to the court systems. So, um, therefore, we must have private institutions that come up in this field and must, must um, you know, build a stage which will make it one of the best uh, in the world and will attract that. So, we had started that. And we had, uh, Mr. when we, Tatar and I met uh, Mr. Kaur and explained to him what uh, this institution was supposed to be, he was very happy. And because of the basic uh, uh, expertise that we had on this, he had also asked me to help, uh, help with establishing the uh, Madras High Court Arbitration Center. I must tell you one thing, because the judicial system demands uh, certain levels of good administrative skills on the part of a judge, most chief justices fall within two categories. They are either good judges or they are good administrators. In my 35 years and odd in the profession, I have rarely seen a judge who is both a good administrator and a fantastic judicial mind. I can name Justice A.P. Shah as one of the very good administrators who was also a very good um, uh, judge. Um, uh, likewise, Justice Kaul uh, was an excellent administrator and was an excellent. I simply love the way that he managed his court time. He didn't have a list of 250 cases before. He just had some 35, 40 cases, but those 35, 40 cases will be heard. However complicated, however prolix the arguments are, those 35 to 40 cases will be at least well, 37 cases. Let's assume you have he had 40 cases before him, at least 37 cases will be heard and judgments will be delivered. And what was more important is that if he adjourns a case to a particular date, and let's assume for the reasons unavoidable, and I am underscoring unavoidable because he would never take a day off from court if it were uh, if it were possible. So um if he was not sitting in court that day. A special bench will be constituted only to give dates. And he will leave his diary with the uh, uh, court clerk. The court clerk will take it to the judges. And when uh, dates are requested, 
he will inform the judges in advance about what dates he would like these matters to be adjourned to. I don't know whether he followed that in other courts, but in Chennai, that is the uh, you know format that he followed to great success. So you would know that was going to come up before him because it will always, if the government took time to file counters, they would face a fine of 10,000 rupees or 5,000 rupees just for the asking you. Government would just not get an adjourn. So you would be sure that the matter would come up before him. He will hear the matter. And no business of you know judgments being reserved for six months, four months, five months. No. Within a month, judgment will be delivered. And he brought in the system in the High Court, which ensured that the date on which the matter is reserved for judgment and the date on which the judgment was delivered, both then went into the judgments. If you today scan judgments of the Madras High Court, you will find the date on which orders were reserved and the orders were delivered. And he made it a rule that no judge should uh, allow uh, more than 30 days to lapse before the time he reserved judgment and from the time he delivered judgment. So he really was a wizard in times of administrative work and in respect in the judicial side. I mean, it is not as if he would not get, I mean, I have never seen him flare into anger, but you could see that he was visibly annoyed and irritated. With but that annoyance and irritate, irritance, you could also see that he was holding it back and ensuring that it did not lead to his uh, flaring up in anger. That's again an excellent before good control of the administrative system, good control of the judicial system, and good control over himself. I think these were the three uh, hallmarks of that person. Thank you. Thank you for sharing those anecdotes with uh, all of us. I'll go to Neha Nakpal, founding partner uh, and then Lord Chambers. Neha, since your primary work revolves around doing a lot of financial crime, bail cases and the like, I would like you to reflect from that point on Justice Sajay Kishan Call's legacy, given uh, that a lot of bails were delivered uh, and his attitude generally was pro-liberty. That approach he took to law where uh, uh, he prided that uh, liberty uh, uh, you know, is something that is a cherished idea. Uh, given uh, your day-to-day -day work in that area, could you reflect? So I'd like to take from what Sir had to say. Honestly, I do agree with Sir completely that the way Justice Call handled his court, um, it was amazing. Every matter reached, regardless whether it reached at 3.50, but it reached. And if he said he will hear it, there was a 99.9% .9 chance that he will hear it. And then very sweetly say, okay, I've heard you enough for today, where there's a little lack of time, but I will hear it on so-and-so date. And let's try and find a solution to it. Just towards the last week of December, I had an insolvency matter before him where he caught, where, uh, caught on to the issue in no time. And he said, look, none of this is going to be decided by you guys fighting and sending this company into insolvency. I want both of you to come with a solution. I will keep it for four o'clock. Come with a solution. I'm going to pass an order. And he told, I was with the, uh, the petitioner and he told the other side, look, if you don't come with a solution, means you're they're right, you don't want to pay, you should go into insolvency. So I'm giving you your last chance. They came with a solution. At sharp four o'clock, the matter was taken up, solution given, order dictated, matter closed. So that was the mindset of the judge. Now moving on to your specific query on look, there's no denying the fact that the man's legacy has the he was. A, definitely came across as, I don't know him personally, but in court, he came across as a very practical, large-hearted, uh, sitting here to do justice, to make sure ends of justice are met. And um, evidently for him, liberty was paramount. It's not that he's not dismissed bails, but that must be a 1%, 1 percentile of all the bail matters listed before him, I'm saying at least in just in the Supreme Court itself. Uh, and he gave a patient hearing to the prosecution side, be it the ED, be it the SFIO, be it the CBI, be it the state generally, but always tried to come up with a solution and always argued more for the petitioner who in, or put the person in custody to say, look, what is being served? What purpose is being served? Why are you keeping under trials in custody? I think that issue of the under trials being an issue uh, in court for prolonged periods of time was an issue very dear to his heart. And that was very evident from the 
manner in which he raised that topic, wanted to find solutions, went ahead and passed orders on that issue also. So definitely, if uh, Justice Call's legacy is really going to be, and, and from, from me who practices more on the criminal side and the insolvency side, I see definitely how he was solution-oriented, which is what commercial courts need to be. And two, when it came to bail, uh, how he was asking a fundamental question and then wanting to proceed ahead. Um, so I think, um, yes, that, that is that is something. Thanks, that is Thanks for that anecdote. Uh, I'll... Go to Kunal Vajani, Joint Managing Partner, Fox & Mutton. Uh, Kunal, you have to, for me, reflect, uh, of course, in addition to what you yourself want to say, reflect on, uh, A, his outlook towards, uh, uh, in a sense, ADR, and also anything that you would like to add. His love for a quick dispute resolution was known. And that reflected either he was adjudicating it through his judgments or relegating it through arbitrations, but ensuring that when it all came back to the court, the restraint of interference that he wanted to maintain with an even hand of meeting the ends of justice was phenomenal. I don't think there is any topic in the Arbitration Act which he has not course corrected, including the last judgment of which he was party to which is the seven judge bench. And he has been a real torchbearer in terms of the alternative dispute resolution mechanism to ensure that it meets the entire fate for which the law was promulgated. If you also talk of what Mr. Raja said and what Neha said, is that the manner in which he handled himself in courts whilst dispensing his duty as the judge, for what was very, very close to his heart was the timely delivery of justice, which is where even on the arbitration side, he ensured that the justice delivery is absolutely punctual. And I still remember his Balaji Baliram judgment, where he said delay in delivering judgments violates Article 21 of the Constitution of India. So his thoughts on it to be a fundamental right that I must deliver justice to you or I must ensure justice is delivered was tremendously helpful for the entire legal system. When you talk of him as an administrator, it is an amazing thing, at least for us young lawyers, to see how a judge through various top courtrooms that he was sitting in, the Supreme Court, was able to ensure with all sorts of techniques which Mr. Raja elucidated, pressure, firmness, and some rigor, yet judges to high courts. He's ensured that the government delivers equal participation from their side in a timely manner for the appointment of judges. This is a matter of a big chatter, but it is something to which we must credit Justice Call to that he has used all his possible techniques to ensure that that vacuum that was being created in the country of lack of judges was sort of attended to by the treasury benches in time. It was very, very important. I think it's phenomenal. One other aspect that we must always remember him for is the judicial discipline that he had. Like Neha said, that he understood that the lawyer on the other side had a diary and he therefore respected the diary on both sides. He had his own diary and he respected the diary on the other side. So he had the judicial discipline to say, that the matter must be attended to and it must be attended to in a timely manner. With that, I think, as we now see him go, his judgments on every single topic that I can, I can't stop telling you the topics. In fact, Neha touched on the topic where he took up that sewer motor repetition for the offenders who were there as under trials and then passed a whole policy in his judgment. Or when you say that he is pro-liberty, but when it came to Navjot Singh Sidhu, he ensured there was punishment. So on both sides, the man has shown that justice must prevail. Correct. 
thank you thank you for sharing those inputs you know uh, on on kunal's point of justice call and timely delivery of justice which i admire about him is that whole batch of constitution bench of matters was posted before him in the same sex uh, challenge marriage challenge and he was unwell in the middle for the 2 3 days of the hearing the show went on he joined on vc and not that while he was on vc he was not participative just as participative as he would have been was he sitting in court asking questions to whoever was arguing so that's the that was the man who was a judge for you who let the show always go on thanks thanks appreciate uh, uh, all of you for sharing the interesting insights anecdotes orders judgments yeah. yeah mr raja uh, one quick comment and then we can close yeah. i think what he said on his retirement day uh, makes a lot of sense that uh, more and more people uh, in the democratic setup want the court to run the country the court can never run a country right so he was very very clear about that and i always like his approach to pas because uh, i had been part of um, a group which had filed the pas against unauthorized meeting see his approach is this he knows that there are three categories of cases one cases that require a judgment to be supported by a political will you can never manufacture a judgment can never manufacture political will so he knows that there are certain cases that where even if he passes a judgment if it lacks a political will it will never get implemented that's one category of cases the second category of cases requires executive will for the cases for the judgment to be actually implemented and he was a master in creating is ensuring that the executive will and the judicial dictate go hand to hand because he will keep pushing matters back to the executive like in this case of unauthorized buildings which we fought for the city of chennai he uh, you know appointed uh, just as uh, ap shah this is ke chandrul the vidas high court had appointed the monitoring committee to look at these issues of unauthorized constructions the monetary committee had practically ceased to exist by 2015 he revived that body he ensured that i went for the meetings even though that i was the counsel for the petitioners i went for each of these meetings and he ensured that the uh, that the government took decisions on its own so what he would do is he would keep on pushing an issue back to the government till the government came back with a solution with solution then he would incorporate into the order which would then there is a sense of belonging uh, that the government would have in respect of a judgment that is i think a phenomenal uh, uh, aspect and the third class of cases are cases where judicial officers must do their bit there he was uh, a little stern with the matter in which he because he knew that all these officers were below him and that he had to infuse he would give them all the protection that they needed but he would infuse discipline he would demand integrity he will ensure that those judgments are up to the mark by holding frequent training programs in the state judicial academy we have done it we have at least had four three or four um training programs on commercial law and the arbitration law when he was the chief justice of the bar i could he through the state judicial academy so he had a different approach to each of these had his statement on his retirement that you cannot expect the government to run the judi the, the, the judiciary run the country is an extremely profound statement which i hope people will take note of thank you thank you appreciate your joining us uh, sharing insights from chennai and your other comments also Uh, uh i appreciate that all of you could make time uh for a special show that we did today on justice sanjay kishan call uh this is indeed a treasured show that we have just com- completed and on his uh, birthday and on his birthday and i think uh, this would be cherished by many many lawyers and the larger fraternity uh, who will watch this thank you so very much for coming thank you, thank you. Thank you.